Today is October 20th, 2021, and my guest is stuntman and action designer Eric Jacobus. He spends a lot of his time choreographing violence in action scenes in movies and video games. Our topic for today is violence. Based on a series of essays Eric has written that we'll link to, and those are about helping us understand the how and why of violence in human affairs over the centuries. And at the end, I hope to bring the conversation around to how all of this infuses Eric's stunt work and, um, and work with violence in, in, in the visual arts. I want to start with a um, – so welcome, Eric, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks for having me on, Russ. I've been listening for years, so it's exciting to be here. Uh, that's great. Uh, I want to start with a quote from um, the opening of the essay. It's fantastic. You say, we hear this a lot. We humans are even worse than animals because we were, we murder one another. That's a half-truth. It's true that animals don't murder one another, at least not very often, and humans do. The other half of the truth is that humans have created entire institutions to avoid violence at all costs, so give humans some credit. Still, you're right. The question remains, why do humans murder one another? Why do fights escalate so quickly? Why do we take revenge? And why don't animals do this? So uh, let's start with animals. Um, why, why, are, why are animals, which we think of as, you know, it's a dog-eat-dog world, nature red in tooth and claw, animals fight, uh, but why does it uh, – it don't seem to be um, – have a problem with escalation the way humans do what's different i think it's more accurate to say it's a dog eat cat world because dogs tend not to kill other dogs and the thing about the thing about uh what would you say intraspecific animal combat let's say for example if a lion were to fight a lion or in your case a dog is to fight a dog uh, a lot of the time the reason a dog can't kill a dog is because a, a dog is just sort of uniquely outfitted to prevent dying at the hands of another dog or at the paws of another dog or the mouth of another dog. Uh, the, the, the natural protection that an animal has is sort of, you could say, designed to protect against interspecific uh, combat and to prevent, you know, death. But even, even if you're, for example, you were to uh, have an animal that could kill another of its species, you know, the, the question is, you know, do they, would they actually escalate to that point? Um, there's, there's sort of, two resolutions to this. The first one is that uh, you'll you'll have sort of a an alpha beta relation where a beta challenges the alpha and uh, and then the beta will back down. Uh, in the other case, you know, the thing the difference between humans and animals is that if a, if a dog puts its paw behind its back, the other dog doesn't think that the dog has a, a shank behind its back or a shiv, right? It just thinks, oh, it's the dog's got a, a paw behind his back. But if a human puts his hand behind his back, you don't know if he's got a rock, a knife, or a CD that he wants to sell you. And it's all based on intention. And that is sort of going to uh, dictate the course of uh, events with human violence as opposed to animal violence. In my understanding of animal violence, not our focus today, uh, but in case we have any animal listeners, uh, my understanding of, of animal violence is it is frequently what we might call theatrical. It is uh, maybe testing, pushing, looking for an opening, but they don't want to die. Uh, and, and evolution has created a certain set of behaviors on the part of animals that reduce the risk of death. You know, another – an animal with horns can gore another animal with horns, um, and they often will lock horns, but they often do that in competing for mates and other ways. But again, it's, it's a show. It's, it's a little bit like a, a boxing match that human beings have. We also have boxing matches as humans. We will, we'll get to that. But as you point out, humans have this risk of escalation, which is a deep, deep insight I had never thought of that fundamentally comes from the human ability to make tools. So uh, in the, in the, world of chimps or um, apes, more accurately, I think. An ape will kill another ape. Uh, it, it might use a, a rock, a tool that it, that it has improvised, but the range of tool making among humans makes violence among humans very different. So talk about that. Extremely, because you could imagine that the first weapon was probably a rock uh, and or a stick, something that was just kind of found in the natural environment. Uh, if you were to try and reverse engineer this. And this is what Eric Gans does in his originary hypothesis. And I recommend, um, you know, reading through his stuff because a lot of this comes from what he wrote. 
And if you were to try and imagine the moment before somebody had the idea of picking up a rock, for example, well, nobody has the idea of a picking up a rock. So let's say you go back to your originary scene, to use his wording, and you have like an animal carcass at the center and you have the alpha. And normally you would have a beta fight the alpha, uh, the alpha wins um, and uh, divides up the meat as he sees fit. But uh, in the case of somebody, it might be the alpha, might be the beta, putting behind their back and suddenly they have a rock. Now it's, it's as if now, okay, well, we no longer are simply anticipating that he has a hand behind his back. And this gets into the mirror neurons of it, which is that if you were to sort of virtualize the intentions of other people, and this is Giacomo Rizzolatti's work that, <clears throat> uh, from Mirrors in the Brain, if you were to virtualize the intentions of other people, Whereas before the rock, it was we were just virtualizing a hand, but now we're virtualizing that they might have a rock behind their back, and we don't know. And that changes the game theory of the whole situation. Because now, if you don't know if the person has a rock behind their back, then maybe it's best for you to assume that they do. So you might as well pick up a rock and attack first. And that is the tendency to escalate. And again, this is, this is not a variable that's within animal societies. I think only in extremely rare cases do you have certain uh, you know, monkeys, for example, uh, using a weapon of some kind. Uh, but I think even then, in those cases, it seems to be almost accidental. It's almost as if maybe they're copying people sometimes. Maybe they're animal experts that could correct me. But So that fundamentally changes the equation. And then perhaps then when you go into the Iron Age, and now you have the ability to fashion sharp tools or even... Uh, yeah, like, like that's why you might have uh, iron taboos, which are very common among, uh, you know, very various ancient societies. Uh, having, you know, having a rock versus having a, an iron knife, for example, it's a very different equation. And so it's almost as if as we go into these new epochs of having a new kind of weapon, you know, the, the Stone Age to the Iron Age and then the Firearms Age, it's almost as if like we're virtualizing higher and higher stress right it's like this the concern grows bigger and then the, the concern becomes like i better get mine first so that's that's the the potential for escalation that humans often have do escalate fights do escalate into, into bloodshed and death we're going to talk about that uh those listening with small children may want to take care because uh this, there will be some um some uh i don't know gruesome maybe We'll see conversation here, um, but I, let's let's back up and talk about mirror neurons because that's something I did. I know a little bit about it, but not very much. Um, mention the name again of the the person who they're not very. Our understanding of them is only about thirty years old, which um, surprised me. But then I realized, why am I surprised? Um, we didn't have much cap capability of finding mirror neurons until recently. Um, so. Talk about that. Talk first. Just talk. Give us some basic information about them, because that that part of this conversation is is utterly fascinating because it builds a biological basis for uh, things like revenge and violence and and rage that I think we tend to think of as matters of uh, civilization, self control, uh, intelligence. A smart person wouldn't get mad over a traffic. <laughs> problem. Uh, so just let's start with the, the basics of mirror neurons. What are they and uh, what do we know about them? The mirror neuron is essentially a function within a certain subset of neurons. Perhaps some people are saying that it's part of uh, more than just the specific subset of neurons, uh, not just within the, within the human brain, but also within uh, various other animals have this as well, uh, which uh, essentially functions as a, uh, a mirroring mechanism uh, in the motor system. Uh, and it works through the, it's, 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 it's sort of simple in a way. Uh, if I could just explain how they were discovered, it'll actually, uh, you know, yeah. illustrate very, very, very nicely. So Giacomo Rizzolatti, who wrote this book, I pulled it out just so people can see it. It's mirrors, mirrors in the brain, Giacomo Rizzolatti. And uh, he, uh, he was doing a test on macaque monkeys, trying to figure out simply where in the macaque brain was the, the neuron center for various motor controls, like grasping, pointing, um, you know, making a fist, et cetera. And so they had probed a monkey's brain, uh, not a very, you know, animal friendly thing to do. Uh, but they found that, you know, they found the, the, the spot in the monkey's brain that grasps, right? So when the monkey were to grasp a banana, it would, you know, beep and it would have a little readout. And then the story goes that they left the monkey hooked up and then one of the scientists picked up a banana himself and then the same beep in the monkey's brain, red, and, and generally the same area. 
and that really that really changed the study, right? <laughs> because now the idea was that well, not only not only are uh, are, are monkeys just you know, coming up with an idea of grabbing and it triggers a neuron firing. Instead, it's also that, well, when monkeys perceive another person and subsequently when we perceive other people doing something, then that actually trips that neuron within that motor system. So just to give a concrete example, if I were to hold out my hand in a handshaking position and you're to perceive this, then what you're doing is you're basically virtualizing in your mirror neuron system my intention to grab your hand and that will elicit almost i mean in some people it might be just you know it, it might just be involuntary a reaction to just reach out your hand and do the same thing uh high five with children if you have small children you'll notice that children high five very early on and it's not a it's not a a, a, a rational reaction it's just that children before the age of two or three are just mirroring mechanisms in a, in a way with the soul right. and and that and by and so by by performing the action by shaking the hand by giving a high five what you're doing is you're building the connection between the mirror neuron and the motor system itself so in a sense you're actually training your body not only to do the action but to understand the intention of other people who are doing that action and so if i and, and so if i were to then uh put my hand behind my back, right? And I were to pull out flowers. And if I just did this your entire life, you would think that anybody with their hand behind their back, you're virtualizing as if they just wanna present you with something beautiful. But if you go to a war zone and somebody puts their hand behind their back or in their pocket, and every time they pull their hand out, it's a hand grenade that's trying to kill you. Well, then you are going to go back, you're, you're being trained to virtualize people putting their hands in their pockets to do something very dangerous. And so when you uh, come back into civilian life, you are now trained to think that people putting their hands in their pockets, children, adults, whoever it might be, are trying to kill you. And so the virtualizer is, is like really that sort of mechanism that trains you to react and understand the intentions of other people. So when you say virtualize, you, it, you mean just imagining? But more than – sometimes in imagining, we think of, oh, I wonder if – and you let your brain run free. This is – Imagining without intention, without consciousness, conscious yeah. intention is what I is the way I would I would phrase it. And the example you just gave of the hand grenade is, I, I assume, the way some people were thinking about PTSD, post traumatic stress syndrome. Right, you're in a war zone. You see a lot of things that you have learned lead to violence and death. You come back to a place that isn't a war zone, and it's it's not it's it's important. It's not like oh. There could be things here that are dangerous too. It's that your brain doesn't think. It just – you don't think in a conscious way about that. You see someone reach in their pocket and you have an emotion – a visceral reaction, I would describe it, right? That's what we're That's saying correct. here. Correct, yeah. So obviously children um, – and if I if I if I could add yeah, a caveat ahead. to that too, it's not. Yeah. It's also not simply you're reading the intentions of people because we can see many 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 examples if we look back in anthropology, for example, of people trying to understand the intentions of the sun or an animal, right? And so we virtualize everything, a and, tree. and we and yeah. by virtualizing it, yeah, a tree, or you know, or the creator himself, right? And so if you're trying to then understand the intention of uh, of of whatever of whatever it is you're you know perceiving then you tend to anthropomorphize it because that's the mirror neuron system that you have and so violence is anthropomorphized there might be an object and so you can also it's it's sort of you're you're inundated by you know these intentions of even an object and by seeing an object even or a location uh, that can have a similar response i think the point about intention is rather extraordinary because intention is Again, I think we rarely think about this in everyday life, but because it's so un it's so intuitive, we don't. I mean, it's so instinctual, whatever you want to call it. But obviously, determining intention is an extremely valuable skill. There, you really want to know about the difference between somebody reaching into their pocket to give you some spare change uh, on the street, or to ask for change, versus somebody's going to hurt you. And naturally, we're going to have a bias toward hurt because that's a good mechanism to have but as civilization advances we we do i think learn that many of these gestures that that might be alarming we start to associate positive intentions with them but but i don't think we can overestimate the importance of assessing intention instantly 
and what I, the way I understand what, what you're saying about mirror neurons is that the speed of this is essentially zero. The time it takes to make these, yeah. can, we, we yeah. jump to conclusions because that's yeah. really a good idea. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes, and as, sometimes. Uh, well, I guess one of the questions would be when, it, when is that, when isn't it? But um, I, I think the point about intention and that we are biologically evolved to both determine it, assess it, guess at it, and of course, provide it as well to others, right? Frankly, I have no idea how the evolution of this could 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 happen. It seems to happen. It seems to be a step nature. I, I can't even speak to the origin of it. But what I what I can say is that uh, the way that the way that the understanding of in, of intentions or of intents, you could say, the way that you actually train yourself to understand the intents of others is by performing the same action yourself, right? So, for example, if you were to go take a boxing class. Uh, the uh, the teacher is going to have you stand in front of a mirror and, and just throw punches. And this is like any martial art class. What you have to do is copy the teacher. And the teacher presumably is doing it the right way. And what you find, so your first sparring lesson, your, your first sparring, sparring, it's going to be a lesson, let's just say, your first sparring session is going to be uh, the other guy hitting you in the face a lot because you cannot read his intentions. But what you'll find is that the more you throw the jab, the more you throw the cross, the, the boxing terms, the, the more that you throw these different attacks or whatever martial art or, you know, if you're if you're in warfare, the more that you do this thing, the more you're actually able to read it in other people. And it's not even a it's not at all rational. So, for example, this is this is why Muhammad conscious, Ali, conscious. Yeah, right? exactly. it's irrational, but it's conscious, it's conscious. Yeah, it's not even really conscious. It's like you said, it's 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 just it's it's instantaneous. But this is why when Muhammad Ali sees a punch coming, he can just move out of the way because it's not that he sees a punch coming. It's that he sees a hip move. It's that he sees the foot pivot slightly. It's that he sees the guy blink a certain way because Muhammad Ali has thrown that punch more times than anybody else. He has developed enough action understanding in the words of Giacomo Rizzolatti to be able to read the intention of other people. And that just comes with practice. And that's something that an armchair boxing critic will never be able to do. But when you say you learn to do this, you know, you, there's different aspects of practice, right? Um, uh, musical scales, say, if you're learning an instrument, you know, you're, you're grooving your swing in golf or baseball. These are forms of practice that are, that are, as I understand what you're saying, different than, than these, say, the case of boxing. You're talking about the fact that your, your practice is doing something – uh, that you're not having to th just not have to think about. You're you're Correct. tapping into this uh, brain skill uh, that allows you to not say, "Oh, he turned his hip. That's a bad sign for me. I bet a punch is coming." So one way to think about that is you just get better interpreting the hip. But that's you're really saying something more than that. It's not again the way we might say, um, "Oh, he brought me flowers. He must be." Making a friendly gesture, it, it, it's something – again, there's not that conscious step-by-step -step reasoning. That's correct. I mean the, the examples that you're giving are single-person um, endeavors, right, golf and, and whatnot. You're not reacting to anybody, but in the case of boxing, you are toe-to-toe -to -toe with somebody. So baseball is probably another example. Football too. Uh, the more that you practice with other people, uh, the more that you can understand the intentions of the people around you. And it just helps you sort of develop a virtual environment where you can take a snapshot of the, you know, the X number of players on the field and kind of know where the ball's going to go. And that's right. an extremely valuable skill. And that, oh, that comes with practice. But it's more than that, of course. There is a biological, you might call it software that works the hardware. You know, someone like Wayne Gretzky was legendary for knowing where the puck was going to yeah. be in hockey. Of course. Muhammad yeah. Ali didn't just practice more than other yeah. people. He had – better neurons or whatever you want to call it. Um, for sure, for the only, sure. The only thing I want to add to this before we move on, and we're about to move on to, to actual violence. Um, if, if you know anything about mirror neurons, you probably know this already. I didn't though until I read your essay. It explains as you write why I cry when a fictional character has something bad happen to them or why when I watch someone absorb pain, a punch, uh, 
a, a, you know, a knife attack, I don't just am, have a mental set of reasoning. I'm my brain is hijacks my emotional reaction, and I have a, a visceral reaction that is that I really don't have control over. It's a be- fascinating thing. I've always been puzzled by that. Why would I be sad when some when a person in a movie dies or is harmed? It's fiction, but right. I can't help myself. Right. Or when a or when a cartoon car or robot dies, even or an right. animal or a tree, you yeah. know, it, it it goes beyond simply other people. Uh, like I said, anything that you can virtualize, you're naturally going to have some kind of empathy for. Uh, you know, and yeah. I was just gonna say, and when somebody cries in 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 a movie or in real life, I find myself often choking up and and right. becoming emotional. Right. And I've always thought, you know. Well, what's that? I mean, <laughs> no, why, why am I seems, gonna... <laughs> I mean, I am. I feel bad for the person, but but why am I crying already? Even though I just feel a little bad. Yeah. But but if if they had told me something sad happened to them, I'd feel bad for them. If they tell me that something bad happened to them and they start crying, I suddenly find tears welling up. But that's ex- that's exactly what's going on here, right? Sure, laughter is the same way too, and this is why they. Oh, put, yeah. That's why they put laughter within uh, trailers now. With you know comedy trailers, they'll have they'll have a joke, and then they'll cut the people laughing, which is just a really cheap way to try and get people to laugh at your trailer. Uh, but that's like mirror neurons one one right there. It's like if you show people laughing, maybe people will laugh, and I think sometimes it's true. Uh, people who aren't really thinking about it, but I think so. I think a lot of the time people want to be challenged, and I think a good a good you know genuine laugh comes from having to sort of process. You know, two inputs and then it comes to an output and you have some kind of new logical combination of the two things. Yeah, I think that the uh, but in terms of, you know, why we cry about other people in a movie or with other people in a, in a movie, for example, or why we follow the hero's journey. Right? Why, why do we care? And also, why do we care that they die? They're, they're fake. Why do we care yeah, that these things die? I mean, people cosplay as these things to sort of keep them alive. It's just almost like new kind of ancestor worship in a strange way. And it's 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 because. You know, if you go back to the Greek theaters, uh, if you go back to just ancient sports, the, the fact that, you know, the sports were always played with a crowd because that was a very cathartic moment for the crowd to witness. And I guess you could say the crowd is all virtualizing the intentions of the hero and also the villain, but they're associating with the hero. Uh, because of whatever cultural inputs there are going to be where you're that's sort of the framework that it's presented to you. And when uh, when the audience is virtualizing with this character, uh, then there's this there's this you call call it again, the hero's journey that you go on with them where you just they, they kind of take you for a ride and they hook you. And this is this is also how, you know, cult leaders work. This is how hypnosis works. This is how a lot of things work that can also be very, uh, very harmful if we're not careful, if we let ourselves be sort of strung along or even narratives that lie. I mean, if you're watching a film about the plights of a poor man and he's, you know, he's poor and he's crying and he's got no money and his children are dying and you show that the fault is the, the Jewish guy next door. It's like, well, wait a minute. Now, now you've now you've taught people to, you know, to be anti-Semitic via mirror neurons. So this is also, you know, it can be used very badly. <laughs> it can be used yeah. for evil 100 percent. And it has. And that's what propaganda does. Fascinating. Now, you talk we talked a minute ago about the. The rock versus the flowers, uh, just for jargon and vocabulary, talk about the difference between closed versus open altercations. An altercation is a funny word. It's like a police uh, notebook word. It, you know, an altercation can be a shoving match, and it can be a fist fight, and it can yes. be something much worse. What's a, what do you mean by a closed versus an open altercation? Well, closed altercation is going to have some kind of external s- suppression to keep things from escalating. So, for example, closed altercation would be sparring between, you know, martial artists in a school, uh, a, a sport, uh, some kind of something that's either for teaching or for cathartic ritual, maybe both. And it's a it's an outside mediator ensuring that the two parties or, or more don't fight to the death there might be some level of escalation interesting you had an episode some time ago i think with mike munger about fighting within sports which i found so fascinating i really helped actually you know at at the beginning of this theory to just understand like where where the confines of this closed 
closed system. And then there's this kind of hernia that happens when, when somebody rushes the mound, for example, uh, or when you have a fist fight within hockey, like they, they, they sanction this stuff to some extent and other times not anymore. They'll change the rules uh, depending on who knows some kind of fallout, for example. But if they find, for example, in hockey that these fist fights are really good ways to generate revenue and they don't sort of bleed over into the audience, right? Cause that's kind of the risk of an open, of an open system is that if you're allowing fighting to the death, well, if the audience then is virtualizing the, the, the main character in the combat as he's going to die, they might take it upon themselves to think the same thing is going to happen with them, uh, with their neighbor next to them, for example, or when they go home or the next week, it's, it's, it's impossible to really know the full effects of uh, violent entertainment on people because it's probably different for every person. It's different for every location. Uh, it's going to, it's going to be, different if there's one person in the audience versus 10,000 people in the audience. There's so many factors. And that's why, you know, I can't take a political stance as to whether or not violence in media is good or bad. I don't know if it stops people from being violent or if it promotes violence. It's impossible to know that. All I can really say is that, like, here are the mechanisms and here's probably why we go to these things is to sort of uh, virtualize with the character. And there, there is this sort of cultural, uh, cultural, what would you say? It's almost like um, acculturation that you engage in when you watch an actor go through this hero's journey, whether in sport or film. And that ends up being, you know, a very common cultural tool that we use for people. But in sports, and a lot of that episode, which I also love, uh, was about the explicit formal rules, what we might call the legislation, versus yeah. the norms or laws that govern and restrict those, those, that violence. So in case of hockey, two people might fight, but it's against the rules. It, it's probably literally right. against the rules, but it's certainly yeah. against the rules, the norms, for one of the teammates to say, oh, my, my teammate's getting beaten up. Right. I need to go out there and, and help them beat this person. You're not allowed. It's a two-person, it's a duel. We'll talk about duels in a minute. Sure. Duels are a fast thing. I'd never thought about them as, as you do, which I, I really appreciate and enjoyed. But th that was about the fact that these norms are restricted, often restrict that, that violence to a very narrow channel. What, what, what it encouraged me to think about is, is the spectators. And as you say, it, it might be cathartic for some, for others it might be inciting. Um, I remember... In uh, being in high school, happened to be in Israel. I was in Israel for high school and for eight months when I was in my junior year. And our team was playing some team that in basketball. And after the game, the the game was over. I think we'd lost. It was a home game, and the fans and the players were all kind of milling around outside the the um, gym. And something there was a violent thing. I don't remember what it was. Somebody shoved someone. Someone um, may have said something that led to a threat. And I suddenly found myself, I, I, I can't tell you how rarely I've ever been in a fight. I've been in a few, but all when I was younger. But at that moment, as a semi-adult at 16 or 15, 16, I think it was 16, I felt an enormous surge of adrenaline. And it didn't come, or something, it did not come from me observing this and saying, oh, that seems like that's an injustice. It came from everyone around me. There, there was a, you know, we took mob, violent, mob rule, you know, it's, a, it's a, a standard cliche. But what you're suggesting is that when I saw my neighbor rise up in anger, I mimicked them. I mirrored them. I didn't say, oh, I bet something really bad happened. I should find out what it is. And if it's important, I'll do something about it. I just wanted to hurt someone. And that's when I realized, as you talk about a lot in your essays, this is deeply embedded in us. It is not conscious. It is not uh, something we have full control over. Obviously, we try to control it in ourselves, but it's, you know, it's deep within us. And it's been I, it, it it might be the first crisis as far as as far as as far as we know, because the propensity to engage in mob violence, as you say, uh, it's almost built in to combat right away. Uh, you could if we go back to that originary scene with the hand behind the back, you know, 
as the subject, then if you decide, oh, I'm going to pick up a rock and do this first, if you're, you can almost imagine then everything just descending into chaos and everybody potentially dying. This could be the end of us if we do this. And so, you know, th that's, that's what an open system would be, where there are no external rules on this thing, where it can just explode out of, out of control. I mean, this is, this is why we try and impose global rules on, uh, on combat. Warfare, yeah. But you talk, but talk about the what you call the contagion of violence, because yeah. I think that's the a nice way to think about the 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 escalation. It's it's not just two people. One says, "Oh, I'm, that might be a rock. I'll go get a rock, or I'll grab this rock that fortunately is at hand because I need to defend myself." It's it spreads more widely. Yeah, it's it, it would work the same as, I mean, you could almost say that germ theory is founded upon this idea. Because before germ theory, the theory was that plague was a spiritual phenomenon. And uh, that was the commonly accepted understanding of where uh, plague came from. And a lot of the resolutions to plague were, you know, the rituals that they would employ were the same rituals that they, that they would employ in order to make sure that they won in warfare or that they or to, you know, as a way to, you know, sort of tamp down human violence as well. So it was all kind of treated as the same sort of spiritual malady. And, you know, if, if we were to try and understand this in the, you know, from a scientific perspective using mirror neurons, then it's, it's that, well, you know, you, you can have, you can virtualize more than one person, for sure. You can virtualize a lot of people. In fact, if you, if you start running a simulation in your mind of all the people around you, and, you know, presumably you know the people around you, you and by the way, in that situation that you talked about, Y'all have kind of come out of it, uh, of some kind of a, uh, a cathartic, you know, ritual of some kind where you're all sort of on the same page suddenly. <laughs> right. And so if you were to watch a movie with your friends and you all come out and you're all kind of like on the same hero's journey in, in a sense. Now, the movie, they tie it up. Right. There's an ending to it. So it's supposed to be over. That's what the credits are for. Uh, but in the you know, it's sometimes uh, perhaps it's not uh, tied up very, very nicely. And so you're still virtualizing. So, OK, well, there's still some kind of, you know, end to this that hasn't been reached yet. And if that end is is achieved by the crowd and you can virtualize that end and you can be a part of it. Well, that that cathartic and you talk about the adrenaline adrenaline rush. Well, after the adrenaline rush and after you beat down the scapegoat in that case, for example, or if you're, you know, it's, if it's group versus group, uh, then there is this sort of cathartic feeling of like, oh yeah, we are assimilated as a group. And that, that is really what you're trying to go for is this, is this, this, this fraternity with other people where everybody is it's now the on tribal. The, it's the yeah. tribal issue we've been talking about on this program yeah. recently over the of last course. couple of years, you know, they're my team. Of course. Literally in this case. Of course. And we can't we can't give a normative statement to that because it causes some ills and it causes some great things, too. Uh, you know, it helps for amazing organization. But, but talk about the, what I wanted you to talk about, if you could, is that this idea of the feud and how, you know, someone in that rock on hand behind the back altercation gets hurt or killed uh what that leads to and, and the way that human societies have tried to respond to that. Yeah. I, the, the first, the first example I can think of uh, comes to mind of the resolution to the feud is the mark on Cain after Cain kills Abel in the Bible, because uh, you know, he, after he killed Abel, uh, he, he murdered Abel. Uh, the idea in you know, his fear was that he was going to be avenged. And so uh, the mark on him signified that nobody will avenge the death. And that was sort of like the first instance, you know, recorded in the Bible, for example, of a way to stave off the feud. And because without that, without that, what you have is if, if one man kills another, uh, let's say, and it could even be in a closed duel, for example, and we can talk more about the duel later. But if let's say it's even a sanctioned duel, you know, there is every there is obviously the uh, potential for um, for another party. To, retribution of course and the retribution is simply i mean it, you're you're what you're doing is you're virtualizing so so okay so uh a uh, man comes into town and he kills a man uh, another man the victim and so the victim's cousin is saying well this man who killed my cousin is going to keep killing other people 
Like it doesn't stop there unless there's a closed system around and unless it's very clearly outlined that this was a duel. And this man, this this man who won this fight has no intention and is like legally barred from doing any further destruction uh, without that. Then it's then it's anybody's guess what he's going to do next. And it's just very natural then for the people who are closest to the victim uh, who are going to sort of like you know, empathize with the the uh, the outrage of this all the more are going to be the ones that reach out to try and seek revenge first. And that's very common. Then, of course, like why why do it alone? Why not just go with all your cousins and take the guy out yourself? And then, you know, three fights, one and then his cousins come back with nine. And then now you have an escalation. Now you have tribal warfare and potentially world war. Oh, it's a, it's a common, you know, it's the human condition I, I what's fascinating is that there are cultural norms and institutions that try to limit that so the to talk about you know we tend to think of dueling as sort of this barbaric thing and especially after hamilton which is a very uh moving and tragic unnecessary there's a couple of tragic and unnecessary deaths it seems unnecessary deaths in hamilton um so dueling is it on the surface seems barbaric, uh, as does as do many other uh, institutions, boxing being one, hockey, football, etc. Uh, but let's talk specifically about the duel. Why is the duel a good thing? The duel is a good thing. Uh, if I were to defend the the duel, the duel to the death, presumably. <clears throat> yeah. In that it. It really seals up the matter, and it's it's if it, 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 the the offender, um, the offender is not going to offend anymore, or the you know the accuser is not going to accuse anymore. Uh, you know, traditional dueling, <laughs> it was actually rampant in France, I believe, in the 1700s, and Louis the Fourteenth really tried to outlaw it, but it was just it just kept happening underground all the time, and dueling was so important, not just not just for settling disputes, but also for finding mates. <laughs> because apparently women prized men who were good duelists. And there's stories about these men who were otherwise very slovenly and not very attractive at all. And maybe they were really terrible people. But the fact that they had such a high kill count uh, made them very attractive. It's, it's, it's hard to know exactly what, what the mechanism was there. But perhaps we have a system there where the duel is a far preferred uh, system than the feud. Because the feud can spiral out of control, and the duel so is the, just extremely closed. The beauty of it, which I'd never thought of, is that it's this additional norm that it's understood that as horrible as this is, that because there's a there's a not unreasonable chance, even when it's not dueled to the death, there's a not, not unreasonable chance that someone is not going to walk away alive after this is over. But at the same time, there is a norm that says this is it. No more. It's just a yeah. one-time. It's a one-time thing, and you don't then get to count, get to uh, challenge the the cousin to a second duel, a third duel. It's it's it, it's quite. I'd never thought about it. I, I just want to add one thing before we go on, because I, I don't want to forget this. You, you'll like this. Um, one of my favorite movies is uh, Yojimbo by Akira Kurosawa. I suspect you've seen it. It's been a while. Correct? I've seen it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I remember watching. I watched that movie in in. Um, in New York City when I was in around college age, maybe maybe high school. And I walked out of the theater and I was so fired up. <laughs> I ended up walking, I was with a buddy and we walked, I don't know, I walked maybe a hundred blocks a, a long way with immense amount of adrenaline. That, that movie uh, just made me want to, I just felt like powerful. And I, I, that is again, it's just a movie. But I think a lot of these um, viol actual violence stimulates these strange biological things inside us uh, that we don't fully uh, are conscious of. I think what it – I mean I'm, I'm sort of being just I felt like, let's myself. I felt, like, I felt like let's fight somebody, which yeah, is right, really weird. Yeah. Again, I'm not yeah, a fighter. Right. But yeah. I said to my buddy, I was like – I didn't mean literally let's go start yeah. a fight. But I felt like – I felt invincible after watching yeah. – the the, the, the the samurai warrior in that movie yeah it sort of legitimizes I, yeah it, it, it sort of legitimizes this view that well we could we could actually end a feud right now like there might be because everybody's walking around with various you know 
various uh, things dragging them down, various grudges that they're holding. And, you know, you don't like your boss, your coworkers annoying, you know, maybe there's something with your in-laws or whatever it might be. Uh, And so, you know, this idea that you could settle things with a, with sword or with a gun, gunslinger movies do the same thing. It's really kind of the same code. And, uh, and this, this idea that you could end the dispute. And, And by the way, you know, even though in samurai films, it almost always ends in somebody dying. And when I was taking sword, a Japanese sword, my teacher told me that a two inch cut anywhere on the body was lethal back then. And because of, because of infection, presumably infection. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, or maybe the, you know, suturing wasn't as good. Who knows? Right. But, uh, uh, the, uh, when you look at even the early 1900s, there are old films of people still sword dueling. You can watch these and they don't normally end in death. They end in a cut on the wrist. It's usually what happens. And that's usually the end of it. And it seems as though that kind of situation, even though you may not die, even though there may not be a dead body at the end, the fact that you are anticipating possibly dying, that does something to you when you enter these equations. You know, maybe you're not even imagining that you might die. Maybe you think you're invis- invincible and then they cut your thumb in half and you go, okay, wait a minute, I'm not invincible. Okay, you know what? It's not worth it. And that's, that's <laughs> enough. We're done. Like, I, I'm not going to complain anymore. I'm not going to insult you or whatever it is, right? So, you know, that taps into something that's very deep within us, which is if you were to imagine, again, going back to the mirror neuron, mirror neuron virtualizer, it's it's so open-ended all the time. For example, when an, when a, when a relative dies, all the things that they wanted to do, all their intentions, all the things that they wanted, you, you, you download all that without knowing it. And it's almost like the whole community might download this person's intentions. They might all have the same dream about the guy. It's very powerful. And the ability to kind of sew that up, to end it, to blunt it, whatever it might be, the duel does that. And that's incredibly powerful. And that's why you kind of go around and go, oh, yeah, let's go. Let's go have it out. Let's let's finish this, because, man, how much how cool would it be to not have to worry about (laughs) the grudge that you're holding against, you know, such and such person? Yeah, well, it's just a. I think I'm a big fan of not holding a grudge uh, in theory and a big fan of not taking revenge in theory. I, I, you know, people have insulted me on this program, actually, Uh, not often, but occasionally I've been insulted and. I work very hard to not respond to the emotional response that that stimulates. Uh, I've, I've learned to observe it in myself, and it's mm. um, it's a fascinating thing. You are incredibly vulnerable in 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 those moments, or dangerous, right? I think we have two yeah. sets of reactions that we've kind of glossed over. You either escalate, oh, you've insulted me, I'll insult you, or you cower. It's kind of a alpha beta male type of or Usually, men uh, in the tri- in the monkey troop or the animal troop, um, you you cower, and the the challenge in those situations, I think, is to find a middle. For me, is to find yeah. a middle path. Yeah. I don't want to scream back at my guests, and many listeners say, "How could you take that? Why didn't you answer?" And the answer is, I don't want to do that because I because that does the next. Then it just yeah. <laughs> not not fruitful, not productive. But the other. The loss of self that sometimes – it's kind of actually what it really is uh, to just be creative about what you're talking about. It's kind of like my brain saying you don't want to get in this fight because you could lose and die. So when someone insults you, the best path is to take it, be humiliated, signify humiliation because then it's over. You're not going to get, you're not going to get hurt which is often not productive in human conversation. Uh, and it ends the conversation in, in a different way than the escalation does. You need to find that middle path. And so what I've what I've tried to do is to be sensitive to when I see that and go, oh, oh, this is one of these things where I'm emotionally way over-involved relative to the actual content. Sometimes it's a misunderstanding. Yeah. It feels like an insult, right? But But a lot of times it's an insult. And when you can learn to just sort of let it slide off. It's really, it's quite, quite liberating. I think that that's, uh, you know, the de-escalation strategy is what you're talking about, where somebody, somebody really wants to go somewhere that's bad. Like they want to go to a fight. They want to get into a shouting match because that's what they know. Uh, That's, that's how they know how to deal with conflict. And, and perhaps in that person's mind, if, and I've, and I've had this happen, a colleague of mine, uh, 
who was a uh, stunt coordinating a shoot that I was a stunt man on. So I was under him and he would, um, he would do this where he would engage and I couldn't deescalate. I, I just couldn't do it. And then at a certain point I just started shouting back and we would have a shouting match. And at the end he respected me because I met him at mm-hmm. that point. So yeah. like, so like that's the other danger is like, are they going to bring you to a point where you don't want to go and you have a loss of self, you've become that person, right? Which is that classic mentor student relation where it's like, they're trying to amp you up. They're trying to do this and that. Maybe you need that. Uh, maybe it's not good. Maybe you just walk away and you say, I need a new teacher. You know, What's, what was the movie um, about the drummer? I'm blanking on it. Whiplash. Um, Whiplash. Whiplash. Yeah. That's a example of, you know, you basically, I'm going to push this person's buttons perhaps as a way of motivating them to be better than they can think they can be. But there can be some sadism there and cruelty, obviously, and a feeling of control. And it's fascinating. Uh, I want to talk about blood uh, and the color red. Um, We react, again, very viscerally to blood, but in different ways, I think. So talk about what, what, what your thoughts are. Yeah, well, the, the, the color red means all kinds of things everywhere. In China, it's extremely lucky. You know, the red is a good color. In India, it's somewhat taboo. They, you know, they change it for, um, um, you know, kind of a, a, a yellow, a yellow color. So it, it just, uh, but then you look at something like, uh, you know, these, these festivals where they throw tomatoes at each other. And you wonder, like, well, why are they throwing tomatoes at each other in Spain? What is it with all this red imagery? And everybody's blood is the same color. Don't believe the conspiracy theories. <laughs> and the uh, the sight of blood, you know, the the thing the thing about blood is it it will it in your mind. And you, I mean, we we like to think that we're beyond this, Russ, but I, I just don't think we are. <laughs> I don't think yeah, we will no. ever be, be. I really don't we're think not. we'll ever be beyond this. This idea that. Like blood is purely a chemical within your body, but you see it in children. When they see blood, like something happens, there's something else that happens to children. And, uh, and you see it too within ancient society is that the sight of blood, and it could be blood on a weapon. It could be blood from a wound. It's going to elicit some kind of a contagious response because what tends to happen in ancient society is that when you have, say, for example, you have a bloody weapon that tends to connote that there's some kind of violence at hand and that violence within all of our minds is contagious to some extent. And so that's why weapons that are soaked with blood have to be, uh, they, they have to be cleansed when they come back, you know, before they go back into the, uh, go back into the, the pro, you know, the vicinity of the tribe, they have to be cleansed. They have to be kept outside for seven days, purified, et cetera. And people who have blood on them, they have to be set apart. It's, it's, a. Uh, it's, it's a very kind of strange and old way of thinking, but I think that it taps into sort of the reality of what blood means to people, uh, which is that it's, it's some kind of sign of contagion. And sometimes that's ill-founded, right? The sight of certain kinds of blood is not actually contagious. They might actually ascribe the incorrect uh, prescription for seeing blood. They might, you know, they, 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 might, uh, they might imprison a young girl in a house for months on end at the sight of blood. And that's not a good thing. I can't imagine that being a good thing because the sight of blood in general does not always mean violence, but that can help perhaps uh, help explain better, some of these. Better safe than sorry was the better ancient. Safe than sorry. <laughs> yeah, perhaps. Yeah. And they probably ascribe some kind of real connection between blood and violence or blood and plague, blood and injury. And sometimes that was ill-founded. I think sometimes they might've been onto something. But I think it just kind of it kind of helps understand like why they did certain things with regards blood and, and red things in general. But the the challenge I, for these kind of ideas and I find them interesting. But going back to say a ritualized fight like a, a boxing match or a hockey a fight in hockey, the bl- if that becomes bloody, like a, when a fighter takes a hit that in boxing that causes blood to to flow, the crowd well. I mean, it's a it's a hideous thing, as we step back and observe it from a distance. The crowd will often roar, yeah. right, as a approval that that the good guy is, uh, or their 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 uh, the person they're rooting for is is winning. What you're pointing out is that it's it's a lot deeper than that, and yet at the same time, there are people who, when they see blood, get faint. 
They don't get angry. They don't get violent. You know, they go to give blood and there's nothing. It's a purely clinical thing. It actually doesn't hurt anymore. The needles are really sharp and, and there's really almost very little pain involved. But emotionally, something else is happening there and they, quote, can't stand the sight of blood. So how do we think about these two extremes mm. where we see blood and we – we a, 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 a huge emotional surge of, of – anger and, and triumph and, and violence surges within us, which is why those taboos that you're talking about from ancient cultures were often there. At least that's your, your claim. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Versus the person that goes like, oh my gosh, blood, I'm running away. And they right. run away. Right. Uh, right. And I, I once babysat for a, a kid who was a little bit of a thug, literally. It was a, kind of a bully and not a nice kid. And um, But he was, it was a, anyway, it doesn't matter. He got into a, he got into a fight. Uh, While well, I was babysitting him, he it wasn't actually a fight. He was just swinging a stick with a, another kid. They had a duel, right? And in the course of that, his lip got cut open. Mm. That ended the fight, mm. and he was like totally blasé about the whole thing. And we went inside to clean him up, and he saw his face in the mirror, and he burst into tears. Yeah. <laughs> and I couldn't understand why this t- incredibly tough kid, he was, ten, he was eight, suddenly had had this emotional reaction. He didn't look good, but it wasn't that horrible, but it was the blood. And how do you understand those two extreme kind of reactions of like, again, total cowering and weakness and mm-hmm. versus incredible anger and, and a surge of uh, an urge for violence? I mean, there's a – and and you see it too within people who are, for example, protest, protesting um, vaccines, for example, where you might have this sort of aversion to anything being done with your blood. And this goes into uh, – a lot of departments of anthropology where blood is the life. I mean, the reason that people would drink the blood of their slain foes was to obtain their, obtain their life. This is why the Aztecs, when they would sacrifice humans and they would drink the blood out of the heart, they were attaining the life of the person. That's why when they, you know, when the Maasai drink the blood out of a cow, they're getting the life. Uh, the, the idea of life being in the blood is a very, only recently have we tried to dispel this idea, but it seems to be sort of active and very, very well alive Fair within common. children. Yeah, I mean, even within children, you don't have to tell them anything. The fact that they see blood, like nobody ever told that kid that if you see blood, you should, you should freak out. No kid is, I've never seen a kid very curious about seeing blood and going, oh, I wonder where that came from. It's like they all know somehow. Uh, all I can say is that there's some kind of deep-seated understanding within people that blood is incredibly important and that it's not, it may be not as mechanical as we're making it out to be. But do you see um, fighting, ritualized fighting, and we're going to now turn to your work. Do you see fighting like boxing, uh, hockey, and et cetera? Do you see that as an institution to reduce violence because Again, I, I'm not. It seems to me it could equally be argued that it incites it. Do you yeah. feel that that those ritualized? I mean, boxing is just a, letting us watch a duel that's not to the death. Yeah, it, it is tragically sometimes to the death. But the, the idea of it is that it won't be to the death. It's just there's certain yeah. rules. Once you get knocked out, there's the idea of a technical knockout. You don't yeah. have to literally be knocked out. What are your yeah. thoughts on that? I mean, unfortunately, the deaths in boxing are usually very prolonged and traumatic and go into retirement uh, from brain trauma. Uh, what's interesting when you look at the rules of boxing, the um, you know the the addition of gloves to the sport of boxing because boxing used to be with bare hands or they had very small gloves and that was to protect the hand, it wasn't to protect the face. And drawing blood was common and normal. And at a certain point, there was this aversion to blood, and then they they basically so now when you have a boxing fight, yeah, when when somebody draws blood, the crowd goes wild. But what happens? That so you get the cut man on it, and if that cut man can't seal up that cut, what happens? The fight ends. Yeah, and that's a standard kind of boxing rule is that like we're keeping this clean. And my my only assumption is that they're they're kind of tapping into some kind of deeper understanding that blood is contagious upon the crowd. Again, we it, it we can't track it with data, but we can just look that when you see blood, the crowd goes wild. And it's interesting to look at something like MMA, where blood is allowed, uh, but it, it it seems as though they've sort of figured out a formula where they allow blood, but the crowd is not any more riled up than a boxing crowd, it seems. Like, I've, n- I've not heard of riots after an MMA match, 
And if there are, maybe it happens at the same rate as boxing. I'm not sure what the numbers are, but the fact that you have explicit amounts, you know, heaps of blood in MMA fights versus almost none in boxing and that the outcomes of the two crowds are not all that different. It kind of says something. Um, <clears throat> so again, I think that the, the idea of blood can be for the crowd can be a very cathartic experience, maybe under certain equations, and it might be a very insightful experience under other equations, perhaps. And I don't know, but perhaps the side of blood within boxing is very insightful, but the side of blood within MMA is cathartic. I, I don't know. All I'm looking at is that one allows blood and one doesn't. But I, I do think um, to take another way of thinking about this, when we think about um, the Roman gladiators and the um, the Colosseum, where crowds of people watch death as a form of entertainment, death, not just like fighting, death. They watch people mauled by animals, mm. uh, and clearly it's part yeah. of the appeal of a of uh, bullfighting is the risk yep. of, and maybe NASCAR. It's the risk that the death is hovering mm. over this, and that adds a certain. Frisson, uh, I don't know, pronouncing it correctly, a certain frisson of 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 intensity, like pay yeah. attention, something here is happening that's serious. Yeah. Don't miss yeah. it. Um, to a world of say football, where it's still gladiators, but the death is, thank God, very rare. But there's a lot of violence, and it's it's a brutal sport. Um, and is that, you know, a way of channeling our urge to watch actual death, which the Coliseum took advantage of? Uh, do you have thoughts on that? I don't know if we have an urge to watch death. I think, I, I, like, I, I don't know if you can isolate that variable. Because did the first man want to see death? I don't know. Do animals want to see death? I'm not so sure about that. Do we respond? Do we respond to war and death? Yes. I ha for example, if you have uh, there was a uh, there was a uh, I can't remember the name, but there was a Greek <clears throat> tragedy uh, actor who uh, who did a uh, I think it was called the assault on Milnes, uh, or the it was about the Persians attack attacking Greece and. It was such a fresh event in the minds of the people in Greece, and he did the play, and the people rioted, and they outlawed the they, they outlawed the the play. They wouldn't let him do it again, and they fined him because it was too fresh in their minds. However, perhaps ten years down the line, or maybe there's like a maybe in the in the case of the Roman gladiators, right? And it, you're imagining the citizen in Rome is sort of. From, from what I understand about the Roman Empire is that the citizen was pretty distant from violence to some extent. Uh, right. Violence, violence was all proxy; was all done with you know their 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 armed um, military. There wasn't a draft, uh, as far as I know. Um, no expert on Roman history, but you know my understanding of warfare back then was that like warfare was done by warriors uh, and, and soldiers. To use your recent example of your your recent guest, uh, but uh, that's, that's Brett Devereaux's yeah, yeah. episode. Yeah, and so it, it, it could very well be that what what we might consider a thirst for violence might simply be us still virtualizing the previous crisis in our minds, the violent previous violent crisis, and trying to sort of interpret reality th through that lens, because that is a lens of PTSD. And we can get into concrete examples if you want. Uh, well, I, I think... It reminds me a family member who's not my immediate family, but I want to identify them. They went – they were – this person w was like six years old, and she went with her mom to a really – to a movie. And there was a, there was a wicked character in the movie, a really frightening monster kind of character. And the six-year-old said to herself – her mom heard her saying this is where I've heard the story – He's nice. <laughs> well, he uh -oh. wasn't nice. But she was comforting herself, and she said it more than once. He's oh, nice. Okay, gotcha. He's gotcha. nice. And I think maybe some of what we see is ritualized violence. Some of the ritualized violence that's part of our culture throughout human history 
is a way of comforting ourselves that, you know, this is violence is not going to kill me. This, this, is, this is my way of saying, you know, it's not going to, that contagion is not going to spread beyond the arena. I think that that's part of it. That, that could very well be. I think it also is a, uh, it's also a very potent antidote to a uh, perceived villain, for example. So you, know, you look at the, the history of um, the WWE and how they, how they integrated a lot of sort of archetypes of foreign characters for the Iron Sheik, for example. Uh, it, they, they sort of provide a proxy scapegoat in a way where the, the, the current, um, you know, whatever the current crisis might be, that this character is going to allow you to dump all of the intent load into this character and say, yeah, yeah that guy's the bad guy. And the villain in your movie, the villain in your favorite TV show, presumably has some kind of connection with a real world villain in your brain, whether you, whether you're conscious of it or not. Otherwise, I don't, I don't know what, why else we would be watching cathartic entertainment, probably in higher volumes than we ever have. I've never heard of the idea of binging a TV show before today. It seems as though we do it more than we ever did before. Well, it wasn't really possible, but I, you know, we didn't have, uh, you couldn't watch 23 episodes in a row, but but I do think it's an interesting question of why we binge watch generally. I mean, it's not obvious why that it would be something you'd want to do, but we do. We're clearly for good and but violent and nonviolent shows. But let's talk about your work. Um, let's talk about the economics of violent entertainment, which is uh, part of what you do with your time in video games or in as a stuntman or as a action designer in, in movies or video games. How does what we've just talked about? have to do with what you do and how does how do you think about it first tell us what what some of the examples of what you've done in your career with with this kind of ritualized violence on screen right yeah, and martial arts is very different than uh a real fight right. most of the time yeah yeah the uh, i mean recent examples i i action directed an indian film called man who feels no pain on netflix uh i did motion capture uh, for God of War 2018, which means I put on a suit and performed combat movements for the character. Uh, recently, we did God of War Ragnarok at the studio. And the, the, what, I, what I tend to do with these projects is they will ask me, how do we design action for this that's very compelling? And you know, action is a uh, is you know, synonymous with violence, right? It's kind of same, same but different in a way. Action is just kind of like a non-normative term for it. <laughs> but I'm, but I'm, but I'm trying to, you know. Uh, so what I'll do, what I'll do is I'll give a, I'll give a presentation for these companies that want to hire us, um, and it'll basically the 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 thesis is, mo uh, choreography is planned movement. And action choreography is planned violence. So if we want to understand violence, uh, action, we need to understand violence. And I'll sort of take them down this. It's not so dark necessarily as I think it's introspective for a lot of them. And we'll go through the, basically the same thing we've talked about. And what we'll do in the end is we'll try and come up with some kind of a system that is going to, uh, uh, I call it an action code, which is how your performers move in their action scene the fight choreography, how violent are we going to make it? Like how cathartic does it need to be? Does it need to be funny? And, you know, is it for kids or is it very dark? Uh, I also have my limitations. I'll only go so far. Um, how the camera also perceives the action and how, uh, even if there's, if there's editing, for example, in the movie or the game, like in a cutscene, for example, how that, and how all that stuff comes together to create some kind of an action code that's going to interface with the audience in some way. Either they're going to respond to it or they're not. Uh, depends on their demographic. Depends on the the uh, if it's a franchise. It's like, well, who who is your who is your audience and what do they like? What don't they like? Do they not like? You know, I mean, you, you could have the same audience watching Harry Potter films and at the same time playing God of War games, and they'll have very different expectations for how that violence should be. You shouldn't be putting Harry Potter violence into God of War. <laughs> it's just not going to work, even though it's the same people doing both, playing both, and vice versa. Exactly, <laughs> and. So that's that, you know, creating that action code um, is also like, how do, how do we know how people are going to respond to action like when they see violence on screen? 
And just to use, you know, personal anecdote, I come from a, you know, a, a family that watched a lot of Marx Brothers and Laurel and Hardy and Charlie Chaplin. And I was very much, I was very much a fan of the performative style of comedy and, and just uh, in, in theater. And so I like Jackie Chan films because Jackie Chan, the camera's wide. There's not much editing. You can sort of see him just doing the thing. Right. And, uh, you know, that's how I kind of came up as a fight, uh, fight choreographer and filmmaker. And then something changed in 2002 where uh, the film born identity came out maybe some people watching this have, have seen it or heard of it and the action scenes in that movie were very innovative in the way that the camera was very shaky the it was the, the editing was very i don't know i don't know it was, it was confusing a lot of the time it was, dif- it was difficult to see what was happening and at the time i reacted negatively to this because it went against everything that i believed in when it came to action but then after doing this presentation I started realizing that maybe there was something to that, that, that film, because Born Identity was in 2002, and that was hot on the heels of a major catastrophic event in America, which was 9-11. And, you know, I think that everybody at that time was a little bit concerned about going on airplanes, probably took a few years for that fear to go away. And again, that's intent loading. You're in the intent load that you're, um, you know, and, and it might be overblown, right? I think it was, it was obviously overblown to assume that every Muslim is going to hurt you, right? And this caused a lot of unfortunate victims, you know, which is sure. like awful. Um, this is where, again, the mirror neuron system can go crazy and sort of like over-virtualize. And this is the whole challenge of, quote, the other people who aren't like you, aren't part of your tribe. Yeah. How do you treat exactly. them exactly. In, a, in a civilized way? Um, my personal anecdote, by the way, is that a few weeks after 9-11, I flew to Athens, Georgia, uh, University of Georgia. I didn't fly to Athens. I flew to Atlanta and uh, took a, a van to Athens to give a talk at the University of Georgia. And, you know, my wife was very worried about, as I was a little bit worried about the flight. Right. But, of course, the van ride was much more dangerous <laughs> than the airplane. <laughs> yeah, my, much more dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. And then, but the part I also remember is I got to the hotel and the person at the hotel was very, very eager to be careful about you know, my license plate and, and check my yeah. who I was. And I'm thinking, you know, you're really not at – no, you're probably not going to get a terrorist attack in Athens. It's a small town. It's not, it's, it's not likely to be a target, yeah. but it didn't matter. People were so yeah. oh, paranoid – not paranoid, right. over, not even overreacting, but reacting I think is the yeah. right way to yeah. think yeah. about it. Yeah, well I- – you could you could say that if we didn't have globalized media, if that had been a local news story in New York in 1950, then you wouldn't have had that issue in Athens. Correct. But now, but now a pebble, uh, yeah. And so now, if you throw a rock through a window in New Zealand, then suddenly people in California are afraid of their windows getting broken. <laughs> and it's just global media tends to do that. It tends to make all of our intent loads converge on the same crisis, in which is going to be overblown, no matter what, like for sure. But. You know, just getting back to the example of 9-11. Yes, sir. When you, when you uh, have sort of a, and it was, it was really a global kind of shared crisis. A lot of people around the world, you know, everybody saw it happen. <clears throat> this is, you know, sort of at the beginning of the 24-hour news cycle back in 2001. Hadn't been going that long. The world had been fully globalized. And so um, the, uh, the entire, at least the entire Western world, sort of understood violence in a new way after that happened. Yeah. And and um, and when you when you are virtualizing violence or anticipating the intentions of people differently and that'll sort of do things to how you perceive action. And so this film Born Identity comes out and I don't know if they meant to do this. I don't know if it was intentional, but the style of action in Born Identity is much more evocative than than showy. And what you're doing is you're evoking a very dangerous situation that's very difficult to understand when you're in the middle of it. But when you come out of it, you sort of reflect on the images and you realize, okay, well, I'm glad Bourne got us through that. And it's because you didn't quite know where you were in that whole action scene. And that's one way, uh, for example, that you could design an action code based on the previous crisis. And maybe that's, maybe that's healthy. Maybe that actually helps people to compartmentalize the PTSD of a previous crisis into the more rational parts of the brain. I don't. I don't remember the Born Identity. I don't even know if I saw it. I think it had Matt Damon. But um, I'm thinking about. I don't like violent movies, so, and we, my wife and I tend not to watch them. 
But there's certain violences I don't mind. I would call it stylized violence, which is a way of saying I think what I think I was hearing you say. You know, a Jackie Chan movie isn't actually creepy. It's it's dance in a way, right? It's performative. It's that it, we, you, we, you and I are calling it choreography. In that case, the choreography is is almost explicit. It's a little bit like wrestling. It, we understand that it's violent, but it has been planned. The, what you're saying about the born identity, it sounds like, is that it's not planned. It doesn't look, it doesn't feel planned. It feels more like real. And therefore, it has a very different impact on the viewer. Is that, is that what you're saying? That's correct. That, that's, that's correct. I mean, the, that's, that has become the gold standard, and it's been the gold standard for a long time within my industry, is that trying to design action that doesn't look choreographed. And there are other films, too, like The Raid, for example, that really kind of taps into the brutal nature of violence rather than the dancey nature of it. Yeah. John, John Wick is another example where it's still aesthetically beautiful, but there is sort of this still concern that one shot will kill. Uh, and that he has a limited number of bullets in his magazine and they keep track as the filmmakers, right? Because it's made by stuntmen. And uh, and so there's there's a whole spectrum of, of violence that you can explore when you're making an action code. And don't get me wrong, you, know, you can, even after 9-11, you can still go back and do the Jackie Chan style of action. You look at the Matrix and Star Wars films that came out yeah. after 9-11, they didn't look like Born Identity. They were still the same kind of action as they were before. Perhaps the code of those films was not as evocative as the Born Identity because as I think as we see, the, 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 you know, the film like, like Taken is another one where they sort of have the same evocative style of action. Uh, and that's the one, just coming from the inside, that's the, that's the style then that every fight choreographer and every stunt coordinator was going for they weren't going for the jackie chan style the kung fu stuff as they called it like that yeah. stuff was gone the shoe leather as they called it you're just getting to the kill you know just get to the kill just get to the kill and and i think that that uh you know this is this is probably also just a byproduct again of the 24-hour news cycle where we are we have more realistic violent entertainment than we have fake violent entertainment at this point. Like we're witnessing this stuff on a global scale constantly and social media only makes it worse. This is very reactive. Yeah. Um, that's why I recommend if anybody's trying to blunt their virtualizer, just just get off of these things and that'll help you. It helps you sleep at night. Uh, yeah. I've talked about the fact that I love the show daredevil. I thought it's incredibly mm -hmm. funny. The, the series on, on, uh, on the web and but after all, I stopped watching. I get depressed. You know, mm. the violence was so vis visceral in there for me. And maybe it was me, but it just uh, it was too graphic. It was too easy for my neurons to fire there and be overly sympathetic. Yeah. I just kind of brought me down. So I just stopped in the middle of it, um, even though I found it remarkably entertaining as a, the nonviolent parts. But the other thing I just want to ask is just I don't know if you've thought about this, but. You know, I've seen this on Twitter a lot. Somebody will finish a series and they'll say, can you recommend anything? And so many of our most popular series on Netflix are gruesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're not just, well, somebody's going to die or it's gonna, there's going to mm -hmm. be some blood. They're gruesome is what I would say. They, it's, yeah. it's sort of a glorification yeah. of, of violence. Yeah. Um, what's going on there? I asked somebody asked me the same thing on a recent podcast, and I think that it's it's not so much glorification of violence as glorification of just mean violence. It's almost like, and I've canceled my subscription. Do you say, do you say mean? M e a n. M e a n. Like, like if you go back and you do your your classic villain who has his final say, you know, I think that in a, in a good film, you can sort of steel man the villain's point meaning that you could state his opinion very cogently and you could kind of make a case for him. And that's what a good villain is because then that yeah. makes a good hero. Yeah. And it seems like a lot of these shows now, they want to etherize the villain, which is kind of interesting. They're etherizing the villain so that they do not have to even explain. Like, it's almost like, it's almost like they don't even have a reason for what they do. I think it's very, it's very mean what they do. And That's so the Joker, the Joker franchise in in, in the Batman, the, the, the new Batman films has that feeling to me. Yeah. I hated those movies for that reason. The first, the first one, the one with, um, can't remember the name of it now. That's sort of the origins of the Batman story with Christian Bale. That 
I love that movie. It has some violence in it. But the later ones I found so creepy and dark, I couldn't enjoy them. Yeah, I think that there's there's probably, you know, there's probably some element of social media culture seeping into narrative entertainment now where we don't, mm. we really don't want to hear out the opposition. Unfortunately, I think that that, I don't want to say it, that era might be over, Russ. I, I don't know. I, I don't want that to be true. But man, any time I used to go on social media, it's like there was no way that the opposite that you would hear out the opposition i found myself doing the same thing and it was just utterly you know you're, you're taking your oxford rules of debate and just throwing them out because it's all about hot takes and it's all about reactiveness and if you say anything about the other side then that means you're xyz you're all these bad things um and both sides both sides of the debate do this and it's just so frustrating because like, again that's the mirroring mechanism because you also will mirror your enemy right like that's what escalation to extremes does in social media they just figured out how to, you know, monetize that. Uh, and maybe that now is becoming the code of violence with movies where it's not about hearing out the villain and understanding where they come from. Uh, it's about just creating a cathartic, bloody experience. The idea is not to convert the audience. It's about to just assuage. It's, it's about it's, it's just about sort of like getting them into the current culture to get them to agree with you as the producer. Because that's what I find yeah. so compelling about. Uh, compelling about something like a like a Charlie Chaplin or a Jackie Chan movie is that the you know the audience is converted at the end of it. If that makes sense. Well, I'm not sure how it applies to the Gold Rush Chaplin film. I, I'm not sure what you mean in the Chaplin <laughs> context. I, I get uh, Jackie Chan, but yeah, I think what what I mean by that is um, in the Chaplin context, there really is no villain, right? The villain, the fall guy, is the hero. That's true. Yeah, that's what comedy. That's, that's what that's what great comedy is. Is that when and it's the same with Jackie Chan a lot of the time too. He has villains, but you know, I think the great comedians would make themselves the fall guy, and comedy expels the outsider, which is why the court jester was always he has a a permanent position as an outsider that you can ex, mm. that you can expel, uh, and he's paid very well for it. Um, Interesting. And uh, but in the case of Jackie Chan and uh, and Charlie Chaplin, well, the hero gets expelled. But by virtue of him being the hero, you're laughing at him. You're also understanding what it's like to be laughed at. Yeah, and so there's definitely some empathy there. And I shouldn't finish any conversation about mirror neurons without mentioning that there are some papers that we'll link to that talk about the connection of mirror neurons to Adam Smith's work and the theory of moral sentiments mm -hmm. and the empathy that Smith argued that Smith really understood this long before we had any of the neuro neuroscience uh, correct uh, in yeah. the early 1990s. Um, but let's finish with your work. I want you to talk a little bit more about it before we finish. Um, besides a hit like The Born Identity that you said, wow, I want to do that. Uh, how else has the have these theories of, of violence that we've been talking about in Mirror Neurons affected your work, if at all? Or is it just that you're reflecting on it in these essays? I, I think that, <clears throat> well, it's sort of made me want to do comedy more than ever, because I think that comedy is in high demand right now, but it's extremely difficult to do uh, a physical sort of Chaplin style comedy in a studio system. It's made me want to do that more than ever. It's also made me think more about, you know, you're talking earlier about like, almost like the mimetic profile of someone like Muhammad Ali, who might have been especially gifted in his ability to see sure. see certain things and to, to mimic in a certain way. It's made me think a lot about autism. Tyler Cowen's book, uh, Create Your Own Economy, he has a chapter on autism, which is fantastic. And I'll never, and like that, that really kind of kickstarted this too. And the idea being that- What does this have to do with autism? Well, if autism, as I understand it, because uh, they keep on trying to diagnose autism with all kinds of new classifications. They, they don't seem to want to settle on a theory. And um, I don't know if I'm on the spectrum, Russ. When I talk about it, people with autism tend to respond positively. So I seem, I seem to be able to understand this, that autism does not have an issue with mirroring and copying people. There is no mis there's no malfunction within the, mirror within the mirror neuron system. There's no malfunction within the motor system with autism. Instead, you have a highly concentrated domain of expertise of mimicry. And it seems as though in the extreme case of autism, 
that when you specialize in one domain, say, for example, there's a blind piano player. I should get his name. I keep citing him. It's a blind piano player who's autistic and he has pitch perfect piano playing. He can hear a four minute long song and then mimic it. So when you have that kind of mimicry ability, how could you say then that autism is, is, a, is a, a mirror function, a mirror neuron malfunction? It seems as though autism might, it might be a mirror neuron uh, phenomenon where people with autism, they, they can dedicate their entire mirror neuron virtualizer to one domain of expertise and perfect it. Yeah. But, but the issue is that if that domain of expertise is counting crayons, how then do you get that person into a different domain and shifting yeah. that is incredibly hard. I think that that would be a very worthwhile field of study because you know, as, as Tyler Cowan said, there's, there's probably a lot more autism going on today. And maybe that's, and I think that it's a developmental psychology. Um, I think it's, I think it's developmental and not genetic so much. Uh, I think it has to do with globalization of intent loads and, you know, the ability to kind of parse that stuff out and hone in on single, single actors. <clears throat> but that, that kind of uh, focus could actually make autistic people, for example, uh, very good at copying movement in motion capture, for example, if they were to, if they were able to shift their domain of expertise to that. And so maybe, maybe by studying mirror neurons more, we'll actually be able to understand autism better and treat it, uh, treat it appropriately, which is that, um, you know, there are shortcomings to autism for sure. There's, there's the, uh, the closing off the, of the sensory organs. Like they try, they cover their eyes and their ears because they don't want the intents being loaded into their virtualizer because it's almost like it's overactive. But then once you, once you actually get them into a situation where they can utilize that, it's like they're better than anybody in the room, maybe anybody in the world and they can monopolize on that. Um, and, uh, and perhaps then you can expand their horizons into um, being able to virtualize other domains besides the one that they're so good at. You know, I have hope for that. I, I have no idea. I don't know if it's going to come from our scientific community. I think that they might be afraid to make a, hypo uh, a theory out of this for fear of offending people, perhaps. But that's been a, a major source of my uh, study right now. It's really interesting. I want to close with just talking about violence generally. I, and, and one of the things I really found powerful about your essays, we've talked about most of them, most things we, that I found you know interesting about it, but there's a piece that's left that we haven't We've only sort of touched on obliquely. Um, I think there's a tendency to believe that people today are, quote, better than people 100 years ago. And, and there are things that are better about life, right? But we're the same animals that we were 100 years ago. And the potential for escalation, the potential for contagion, the potential for an open altercation instead of a closed one, I think haunts us for forever. And... I like to, uh, you know, I've used the phrase here before that the, you know, the veneer of civilization is thin. And I think the observations you make in these essays captures that in a different way than I've, than I've thought about it. Um, there's something dark within all of us that we like to pretend isn't there. And um, we are both gifted and cursed by those um, currents that run deep within us, in my view. And I think part of what civilization is, is the attempt to, through the duel, through all many of the things we've talked about, maybe through watching the right kind of movies or sports, to temper that within ourselves. But um, to pretend it's not there, or that it's irrational or uh, foolish, I think, is, is to be blind. I agree with you 100%. In fact, I don't even know if what, if what I'm doing is helpful. And, and I, I honestly, I struggle with this all the time. You know, I, to your point that, you know, today it's almost as if the globalized world is making the um, uh, the reality of an all-encompassing crisis all the more real every day. Uh, we're so globalized. In fact, I don't think we can become more globalized. Aside from a few, you know, a few countries that aren't quite online corners. yet. Yeah, right. Corners. You know, like if, for example, if China and America join their mass media and social media, then you have a fully globalized world. And then now what what then is the outside imposition that's going to keep conflict from exploding <clears throat> um so i i i think that the um 
I, I, I really, I really do think that the important thing now for us is maybe not to be seeking out the answers in media. Like maybe the solution to your daily problems, speaking rhetorically, is not so much watching your favorite character for five hours every night on Netflix. I don't know if that's doing good or harm. I don't know. I, I, I don't have a brain probe to figure that out. But perhaps, and you said, we're no different than we used to be. And I agree with that. I don't think we've, I don't think we've evolved beyond this at all. <laughs> I just don't, I don't see any evidence plausible. Of, it, of it at all. No, I just don't see it as possible at all. Uh, we've put our, we've, it, what we keep doing too is, you know, with this, in, with this looming crisis that we're constantly virtualizing and we're all doing it now. And there's all kinds of crises that we're virtualizing. Uh, fertility crisis, violent crisis, perhaps some kind of fear of famine and, you know, shortages and things like these are, these are, these crises go back to the beginning of time, but even economic crises. Yeah. Right? Right? And we're, they all sell like, they all sell like hotcakes. So the media loves waving them around because yeah. they click, click, click. <laughs> yeah. And it, what it, what it does is it prevents, it presents an interesting opportunity for a new priesthood to come out and say, Oh, I have the solution to that. Just yeah. pay me, just pay me rents and I'll take care of it for you. Read my book, watch my podcast, whatever it might be. I'm going to solve Elect the problems. Me. Elect, Elect me. Elect me. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Or just let me take power. Just let yeah. me do what I need to do. And, you know, if we are so hungry for these, uh, for these resolutions that we'll actually, you know, let some madman into office, uh, who's going to, who knows, who knows what, um, then, uh, then maybe we've, uh, Maybe we've sort of lost sight on uh, of of who we are as people. <laughs> My guest today has been Eric Jacobus. Eric, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks for having me, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.